Hey everyone, welcome on into the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I'm Bobby Sylvester. I'm not joined by Mike Tagliere today. I'm sure he'll be back soon, just dealing with a little sickness. We've got two great guests coming on today. One for the first half of the show. It's Jason Moore, the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. And we're going to be talking running backs and wide receiver pickups with him. And then Joe Pizapia of the Fantasy Black Book Pod is going to be coming on for the second half of the show to talk tight ends quarterbacks, DST, and we're going to play a segment of Drop or Keep as well. These are two of the funniest guys in the industry. We're going to have some fun as well, but before we get into that, I wanted to tell you about a contest we have going on right now. We're giving away a signed Dak Prescott full-size Cowboys helmet. You can check out the details at fantasypros.com slash contest, but it ends this Saturday night, so you're going to want to get your entry in, and here's how you do it. You leave a review on iTunes or Stitcher, then you take a screenshot of that review and send it to us at contest at fantasypros.com. And we're able to do that giveaway thanks to Pristine Auction. And you guys are going to love Pristine Auction, especially since you're going to be shopping for gifts for your dad or your brother or someone in your family, maybe a boss or something like that. And you're going to be able to find something that they love at Pristine Auction because they've got hundreds, sometimes even thousands of items that they auction off every single day. So there's players from every team and players that you wouldn't even dream to be able to find stuff on. I found some of my most obscure favorite players on Pristine Auction to add to my cave. Right now I'm checking out, this one's not obscure, but a signed Kurt Warner mini helmet that I've got my eye on. Yeah, I was an old St. Louis Rams fan and I loved when Kurt Warner was playing. That's when I really got into football as a kid. Tells you how young I am. But check out Pristine Auction. Everything's guaranteed authentic from only the most trusted sources. And when you sign up at Pristine Auction, it's free to do, by the way. Enter the registration code Fantasy Pros. It's going to get you $5 off and it's going to tell them we're sending people their way. That way we can keep doing these giveaways like the one we have going on right now. Again, at fantasypros.com slash contest. And I'm now joined by Jason Moore. He was a top 10 most accurate expert in 2017 and 2018. So you're definitely going to want to listen to what he says. And he's also the co-host of the award-winning Fantasy Footballers podcast. You can follow him on Twitter at Jason FFL. And Jason, you owe me an apology because today I was eating steak at lunch and you made me laugh talking about digging through dog poop on the Spitballers podcast. Oh, well, I apologize for <laughs> nothing. You're welcome. I have increased your joy. And uh, I'm glad to hear that uh, that you were eating steak because it's delicious. Yes, it really is delicious. And I was really disappointed that nobody said put steak on a sandwich. Like, come on, you're really going to get, like, turkey lunch meat? Come on, guys. Well, I mean, we're building a sandwich. I mean, how often do you think, like, <laughs> I'd like a sandwich. Hmm, I'll take a steak sandwich. It's just not. Every day. That's what I think every day, Jason, and I make it happen. I think you're, I think when you're getting steak on a sandwich, you're ruining the steak with slices of bread and vegetables i think that's definitely fair that is a good point all right jason well we're talking running backs and wide receivers today for the first 30 minutes of the show and you know it is a a fairly exciting waiver wire week because we have rashad penny to pick up i'm assuming he's your number one pickup of the week as well you know i'm not sure that he is uh my number one pickup of the week there's plenty of arguments to be made for him uh but minnesota is still great against the run we don't know how that timeshare, you know, is it really going to be an even split? Is he going to take over? You know, I've been a Rashad Penny truther forever. I loved him coming out of college. I think he's got the talent. We've never really seen him just be sucky. Uh, he just hasn't had the opportunity. So I do like him. He's certainly on my list. I'm not sure that he would be numero uno simply because of the matchup. Interesting. Okay. So I, I agree. This week, week 13, even if we knew he was the starter, what would it be, like a middle RB2? And we, we can't know. We can't possibly know whether or not Chris Carson's going to lead this team in carries. Maybe they just go right back to him. It's the same old 70-30 workload. But maybe, I'm thinking, we get Rashad Penny as the starter this week, and then weeks 14, 15, 16 against the Rams, Panthers, Cardinals, he would probably be an RB1 if he took over Chris Carson's workload, right? Yeah, but he's not going to. I mean, the, the, I mean, the reality is, uh, Chris Carson has gotten them this far. I mean, the the Seahawks are one of the best teams, you know, in the league. <laughs> they're they're right. They're nine and I 100 percent agree with this. I think a lot of people are going to argue. Well, Penny might be just as good. We just haven't seen him get the touches, and he doesn't fumble. What would you say to them? I would say that Chris Carson had fumbling issues early in the season. It didn't happen. Chris Carson. There were all these narratives pretty much for like every other week the last two years and Pete Carroll has said Chris Carson is our guy now this last week the the script flipped the carries were in favor of Penny so if you're telling me like hey from here on out 
think it's going to be more like a 50-50 timeshare. I can buy into that. I can. But it's not going to flip. It's not going to be like, okay, Chris Carson, this guy I've loved, I've supported, who's gotten us to a 9-2 and two record. He's been the centerpiece of our offense. You know what? I just really like this other guy, and I'm just going to – I'm just going to totally change <laughs> because we're nine and two and Super Bowl bound. It's, that's just it's just unrealistic. That's fantasy, right? And because the defensive end blew a blew a containment assignment, so we went for a 58 yard run. Yeah, I mean it, it's it, it's really just fantasy owners wanting to call their shot and get it right, but I doubt that happens. Sure. Yeah, but I have a lot of Chris Carson, so I'm really hoping that all those people are wrong. I do think they're wrong, though, because I think this is Carson. Well, it's Russell Wilson's offense, but I think it's Carson's backfield. And uh, so I don't know if I'm comfortable spending all of my remaining fab on just a, well, maybe we have something here, which is the way that I see Penny. How much fab would you spend on him? Yeah, I mean, I, I would I would drop probably, I mean, when you say how much fab you would spend on him, you go, you give okay the percentage of the hundred dollars. You know, I'd probably be in like the fifteen dollar range, I, which means I I might not get him. But that's always at this point in the year that's unhelpful, right? Because uh, who who's playing? Who's going to pick him up? How much fab did they have? If they've got twenty dollars of fab left and you can spend twenty one and you want him, go go do that, or you know, vice versa. So all of the fab amounts at this point. You have to look at your opponents. You have to look at the league and be another layer of being wiser than just deciding what number you like. So is there another running back that you prefer to Rashad Penny, or was it a wide receiver, a tight end, a quarterback that you were talking about as your number one? Uh, I, there's a handful of, like, tier one guys. As far as at running back, you know, if we knew – I mean, it's similar, right? Like, we don't know the split that's going on with Rashad Penny – but Benny Snell looked really good this last week. You're talking about near 20 carries. If James Conner, who has not been able to get healthy this year, if he missed another week, you know, at Cleveland, Arizona, Buffalo, I mean, who, however long he ends up missing, Snell looked really, really good this last week. Granted, it was a it was a cake matchup, and Cleveland's a little bit more difficult. But I'm always, you know, look, you just can't say no to 20 carries. I I want that in my roster. Why do we say a cake matchup? Because as far as desserts go, cake is like the worst. Cake is just a little bit better than bread. Like, why don't we say a cheesecake matchup? I think it's a matter of being easy. Do you know how hard it is to make a good cheesecake? That's difficult. But <laughs> anybody can make a nice cake. It's just, it, you know, it's the easiest thing in the world. You can go to the grocery store, pick one up. It doesn't even matter. They're, they're just easy. They're soft. So, I mean, look, a cake matchup, it, this is easy. It, it still tastes good. It's soft. I, I can get right through it. A cheesecake <laughs> matchup, I feel like that's a little bit more difficult. I feel like cake's at least better than pie because, like, fruit doesn't really need to be warm and soggy. Like, that's just messing up. Um, as far as I'm concerned, like, if you're bringing something to Thanksgiving, just forget all the norms. Who cares about pie? Just bring a cheesecake. Yeah, I feel like you're pigeonholing pie a little bit, though, because, I mean, not all pies are warm and mushy. You, a banana cream pie is fantastic, a nice cold. Well, yeah, that's good. As long as you're not, like, putting fruit or vegetables in my dessert, I'm happy. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I, when I get, <laughs> like, an apple cobbler, uh, th you know, this is – that's health food. That's That's how I eat <laughs> – that's how I get my vitamins and minerals. So, Jason, I think uh, you and I, based on what I've seen so far around the industry, might be in closer agreement than the rest of the industry. I, it seems like most people have Penny way up there, and I've got Snell neck and neck with Penny. Now, I still have Penny as my number one, but only by a little bit, because Snell does look fairly good, and it comes more down to this offensive line. Pittsburgh's got one of the better offensive lines in the league. We know that Snell can handle, handle a big workload. He just uh, touched the ball 22 times. 18 times in week six we've seen him do it throughout college no he's not going to be using the passing game but with the upcoming matchups Connor being banged up with the shoulder issue and uh and Jalen Samuels just frankly being in the doghouse I think this might just be Snell's backfield for the next two or three weeks yeah uh Snell could be a real I mean I I really liked Snell got just you know you know draft Twitter hated Snell because it was it was Benny Snail he was slow and and whenever I watched him I was like I get it. He's not going to have these breakaway 30, 40, 50 yard touchdown runs, but he just, he stays up. He's got power. I mean, there's a reason, you know, he was leading SEC backs and yardage. He, he's a quality back. Despite a bad offensive line. Like he's just a good football player. Good instincts, good vision. Uh, Devin Singletary is pretty slow too. Dev exactly. Devin Singletary is electric though. He's in that I just can't imagine trying to tackle him. I would I would <laughs> jump and then he would like 
you know, ninja smoke bomb vanish. He's got some serious acceleration. That that kid is a lot of fun to watch. Uh, but Benny Snell, yeah, I think he's going to be capable um, for the, for as long as he's the starting running back. And so I would spend about the same, that 15% mark. I've got Penny around 25%. Now behind these two, it comes down to, you know, what do you really need? Um, if you're already in, in playoff position, would you rather pick up someone like Penny or Snell as your RB4? Or would you rather go high upside potential league winner with Alexander Madison or Tony Pollard? Yeah, I mean, it, it, I'm not going to pick up Benny Snell necessarily over over my, you know, if, I, if I've if i got Cook, I'm getting Alexander Madison. I'm getting my handcuffs over uh, a fourth running back that's not going to crack my roster. That's uh, the context matters here. I, I would definitely protect my roster if I'm playoff bound. But if you need to get in, uh, then, you know, Snell Snell's pretty good. And another name I would throw out there, he was obviously widely picked up this last week but he's still only 63 percent owned in in the data that I look at which means some people didn't believe didn't buy in and I think Marlon Mack misses some time so Jonathan Williams who clearly you know got the shot again they said okay even though Jordan Wilkins was active they like what they've been seeing I you know was reading up on the on the coaches last week about what they've loved when he was on the practice squad and just you know, lighten it up, and then they gave him the shot, obviously, back-to-back over 100-yard games. Um, I would certainly, if Jonathan Williams is out there, he, to me, is a guy that could end up as a really strong fantasy option for the next month, which could take you all the way through the championship game. I would agree with that. If he's available, he would be my number one running back pickup. Um, I am a little bit worried about the matchups in week 14 and 15 against Tampa and the Saints. But, I mean, if you're going to give me 25 touches from any running back, especially behind this offensive line, yeah, okay, sign me up. You know, it's it's just so funny looking back when we're writing these bold predictions pieces and doing the podcast episodes, you know, in the preseason. We're trying to come up with these players who are going to be the next Tim Hightower who in their right mind could have thought Jonathan Williams would go for back-to-back 100 rushing yard games? Yeah, I mean, you, you, if you're talking about early in the season, you, you'd say, where is Jonathan Williams? Is he even in the NFL now? Yeah, right, exactly. It's just absolutely amazing. I love fantasy football for that reason because it's just so difficult to pick, and it's such a challenge. Now, uh, I, I also mentioned Tony Pollard. If you are picking up, say you don't have, uh, you don't have Dalvin Cook, you don't have Ezekiel Elliott. Do you see a reason to scoop up these guys just in case you just magically get an RB1 handed to your team? Certainly. Um, there, there's no doubt those guys have value for the entire league. I mean, and, and look, let's say you're out of the playoffs, and, and this is this is widely people, – people are not in agreement here. But over at the Fantasy Footballers, we want people playing through the end of the season. We want you staying committed, staying involved, because it's going to help your next season. It's going to make you – Remember what happened at the end of the year. You're going to be better in the draft season. But I'm I'm picking up out. You know, he's not my handcuff and I'm not in the playoffs. Well, you don't get him because I can grab him first and I'm grabbing, you know, Alexander Madison and Tony Pollard and Gus Edwards and Raquel Armstead. Those guys are – those guys should be rostered in, you know, 100% of leagues. Not every team makes sense for them. But, uh, yeah, grab those guys. Now that we're beyond the buys, it just really doesn't make much sense to own that fifth or sixth wide receiver who's just a depth piece or that, you know, Frank Gore type of guy that you can play if you really need or a backup tight end. Buys are over. If you've got injuries, that's one thing, but I think you've probably got an extra spot at the end of your bench for Madison or Pollard. Uh, Now, any other running backs you are really excited about this week? Allison, uh, Frank Gore, who I just mentioned, Naheem Hines, Daryl Williams, maybe just in case. Uh, the The only place I would go here, and that would be to Kansas City. To me, it would be LaShawn McCoy first. He's still available in about half leagues because of the bye. He was dropped um, all over the place. The last two weeks, I've seen a lot of leagues where he's dropped. I'd pick him up because we don't know yet the status of Damian Williams. I was trying to find it. They've only been in the facility for a day. And for some reason, the the beat reporters did not ask Andy Reid any questions about Damian Williams. It was only about uh, you know Tyreek Hill and Shady. Shady is out of the concussion protocol. So, yeah, I I would say those guys are both worth a speculative ad because if it turns out that the ribs are still an issue for Damian Williams, then you've got a starting running back for the Kansas City Chiefs. Exactly. Yep, that's a good call. I've got uh, Williams as my number six just behind Allison because Allison, I mean, I don't know if he's going to continue to be the starter over Brian Hill. They've got a bad matchup this week against New Orleans. Um, and, and Devontae Freeman's probably coming back anyway. They've got uh, week 15 against San Francisco, but he is a starter. 
And I'm thinking if I add him, it's just for week 14 with the chance that I've got the starting running back against the Carolina Panthers, who not only had the worst running defense going into this week, but they just lost their second best run defender as well. So uh, it's just a speculative ad for week 14. In hopes that Freeman is still gone. All right, we're going to get on over to wide receivers here in just a minute. But first, I wanted to tell you about our waiver assistant, which makes my life so much easier. As you can imagine, I play in a lot of fantasy leagues, and so I don't want to be going to five different websites every single week to do all these waiver wire pickups. I just go to fantasypros.com slash myplaybook, and basically what it's going to help you do is identify all the top players to add in your league. What I like to do is when I go to the waiver wire assistant is I like to click the drop down there by rankings and just select the current week, week 13, and it's going to tell me based on the percentage of experts who would add that player to my starting lineup this week. That way, if there's anybody sitting at 30%, then I'll think, okay, maybe I need to pay attention to this one, uh, and it really helps me out so I don't have to go to all the websites. And it's going to give you all kinds of detailed analysis on the impact of your team as well. Again, check it out at fantasypros.com slash myplaybook. I'm looking at the wide receiver position now, which is where we're going to move, and it's really ugly. Like, there's maybe five guys I would pick up over Allison. I guess if you're really desperate for a wide receiver, you can go with one of these. Do you have a favorite of the group, Jason? Yeah, you know, uh, one of my favorite pickups of the week is actually Sterling Shepard. Uh, finally gets back from concussion protocol, and he, you know he's obviously been out a long time. The schedule opens up for them so nicely here after another week. You, you've got you've got playoff schedule of Philly, Miami, and Washington, and you've got a player who I believe is extremely talented. You know, people have been holding on for Slayton. Slayton is just not as talented a player as Sterling Shepard is. You look back, you know, at at the game logs, and amazingly, the last four games, including this past week, nine targets a game to Sterling Shepard, and. While not every game is going to be a big blow-up game, I mean, we've seen that, right? Daniel Jones is very hot and cold. He can blow up. He can have monster games. So I think Sterling Shepard is a guy that's been forgotten and just kind of left for dead in fantasy because of all the games missed. But he's a good player who's getting a lot of targets with a good schedule. That's the type of player I want on my team. So far this year, seven targets, nine, nine, nine and nine. You know he's going to get consistent targets. Uh, the matchups coming up are not so bad either. Yeah, if Sterling Shepard's available, he would be my number one as well. Now, my one concern with him is he was so effective out of the slot last year. Now, they added Golden Tate, and we got our first look of them both together, and it was Tate who stayed in the slot, Shepard who moved outside, and it wasn't a good performance. Now, granted, they were playing up against the Bears, so what did we expect? But it just makes me wonder, is he going to be as effective? Re regardless of that answer, if he's available, I'd much rather pick him up than even my number one. Yeah, I mean, obviously, against the Bears, you're, I'm not picking him up based on, oh, we got 15 yards on nine <laughs> targets. This is, uh, you know, this is a body of work of a career. And I, I actually think Sterling Shepard's a great outside wide receiver as well. So I, I'm not worried about the... Whether you whether you're outside or in the slot, I think he can do work both places. The Bears were a really tough matchup. He was just coming back, you know, trying to get everything figured out. I'm not sure what his snap percentage was on that game, um, but I I would be surprised if he was in the 90s. So Jason, I hesitate to say this because I know people are going to come after me on Twitter. This is a guy that both Tags and I were excited about in the preseason. And it has not worked out at all. I don't think that that means you should write him off entirely, though, especially because he's got 20 touches in the last two weeks. I'm talking about Anthony Miller for those Bears. This is someone who was extremely efficient last year when he was on the field. Uh, he was banged up. He dealt with several major injuries that he actually played through quite a bit. And he started the season not getting any snaps. Last two weeks, he's been on the field. Last two weeks, he's produced all right. He just can't get in the end zone. But I watch him on film, and I'm like, this kid is a good football player. He's bound to catch a touchdown eventually, perhaps as soon as this Thursday against the Detroit Lions, who are a terrific matchup. How do you feel about Anthony Miller? Yeah, I, I think Anthony Miller's a good uh, player in general. I don't love tying my success of my deep into the playoff run alongside Mitchell Trubisky. Sure. Now, Trubisky, <laughs> who you know I am uh, well known for, uh, disparaging for the entirety of his <laughs> career I absolutely think he is not a good quarterback and now everyone is of course on board because he is not a good quarterback he does have a tendency to have 
big games against the worst of the worst pass defenses. Uh, I've looked up, you know, his splits over the last two years with Nagy in those games where he's facing a bottom 10 pass defense. He averages 26 fantasy points a game. It's 10 when you're talking about the top. Here's the issue for this coming week is there's two splits that Trubisky is widely better at. One is the he he is just fine when he plays a really bad pass defense, and he is he is much better at home than on the road. So this last week, I was actually in support of Trubisky as a good play that worked out. He was at home against a you know bottom ten pass defense. Uh, going forward now, I mean you've got a good matchup this week, but you know the it's on the road. Um, so you know I I don't really want to tie myself to Anthony Miller all that much because he's you're getting the number two for Trubisky. That's the truth. You, you know, there, there might be a game where he's... And some weeks he's the number three. Some weeks Taylor Gabriel gets 14 targets. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I'm going to stick with Allen Robinson and nothing else from the Bears. <laughs> That's entirely fair. Hey, by the way, guys, when I told you that Jason's been top 10 in Fantasy Pros football accuracy in two of the last four years, uh, he's actually number 10 right now through 12 weeks. So uh, actually, I guess through uh, 11 weeks. We haven't graded week 12 yet when we're recording this, but... Um, you're at number 10 right now. That's amazing. Out of 140, that you're consistently that high. You're doing a great job. Cha-ching. <laughs> you are ahead of everybody else from the fantasy footballers. Yes. Oh, of course. Yeah. No. A Andy and I are battling <laughs> back and forth here. He's pretty close. I think he's number 15 or so. He's 15. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll, I'll, I'll keep him in the rear view. <laughs> All right, moving on to the other wide receivers. And as I mentioned, it's really bad. If you need to pick up a streamer, would you rather go with Robbie Anderson against Cincinnati? I mean, Randall Cobb's been hot, but against Buffalo this week, A.J. Brown had a big week. You mentioned him earlier. Anderson, Cobb, or Brown, if you had to decide? Um, if I had to pick up one to have a spot start this week, it would be Robbie Anderson. I, I think, you know, his touchdown in back-to-back -back weeks, five targets, four for 86 this last week versus Oakland. The matchup is fantastic at Cincinnati. Andy Dalton is expected to play. That's good news for Robbie Anderson because that means Cincinnati might be able to actually move the ball, score, need to force the Jets to throw the ball more. I actually like Robbie Anderson. You you talked about you got a lot of flack for bringing up Anthony Miller in the whole preseason and it didn't work out to start the year. Well, that was the same for us with Robbie Anderson. His talent is unbelievable. You start the season out and he was injured and then Darnold was out. and They've got a third string quarterback in there, yeah, and he's got these horrible matchups. Right when Darnold gets back, you're like, okay, there's a good matchup, and then Robbie Anderson doesn't do it. It's Jameson Crowder. But now you look at the last two games. He's had two back-to-back -back good games, a great matchup. I'm going to play him. I do love the talent of A.J. Brown. I wish to high heaven that they would make him an 8, 9, 10 target uh, type of player. He's like a bigger Golden Tate. A.J. Brown's so exciting, but they just won't give him the snaps. He's a giant Golden Tate. This guy is the biggest... I don't get it. I don't get why he's so big. Because when you look up his <laughs> his stats, like there are giant wide receivers out. Here's here's what according to you know like Pro Football Reference, they have him at six foot two twenty five. That's not a giant. That's just you know that that's not Larry Fitzgerald's bigger. But you watch him on the field, and for some reason he looks like a tight end. I just don't believe any of the measurements. Maybe he was still growing. He moves so well, too. I don't know if I've ever seen the first tackle attempt actually get him down. Yeah, he is a beast of a man. I, I was fortunate enough in uh, my main league of record this week to run the Ryan Tannehill, A.J. Brown stack out there as a last-second pivot. At a baby. <laughs> yeah, it worked, it worked out very nicely. But, you know, the, the matchup against Indianapolis, I expect that to be a little bit lower scoring this coming week so that it's basically the matchup play is why I go Robbie Anderson uh, out of those three and and while I do think Cobb is a four real target for the Cowboys the Buffalo defense has just been so great and Cobb could easily end up with you know 10 targets and still have a bad game so I'm gonna stay clear there I mean, even Michael Gallup is a fringe start for me this week. I've, I did my early rankings, and I've got him at 34 right now. I mean, that's someone you're probably going to start, but just because Buffalo's defense is so good against the pass, uh, I don't exactly want to mess with this game too much. Are there any other wide receivers, if you need to stream someone for this week, that you'd feel comfortable picking up, plugging in, and playing? Yeah, yeah, there's there's still a couple other guys. He's owned everywhere, but I have to say I, I've been madly in love with Devontae Parker for m the last month and it's continued to work, but he's probably owned. Um, some two other speculative ads that I think are definitely worth picking up. 
is McCole Hardman. We don't, you know, look, the Andy Reid says we're optimistic about Tyreek Hill's hamstring. I am as well. I expect Tyreek Hill to be out there. But if he's not, or if he re-aggravates it, or if he doesn't, and Tyreek Hill is fine and out there, McCall Harmon is a guy that needs about three snaps to be able to have a good <laughs> fantasy relevant game um, against Oakland. I mean, I, I would be willing. He's one of those guys where it's like you're in your flex spot and you've got Royce Freeman who's going to touch the ball more and he's going to cap out at about. He's guaranteed for five or six fantasy points. Would you rather have that or take a chance at 20? Always rather throw McCall Hardman in there. Yes, his floor is lower. But so what? I, I want a guy who can get that 20. So McCole Hardman is on my uh, radar. And then also Russell Gage. Russell Gage was a guy we hyped up this last week, uh, had 10 targets, 8 for 76, wide receiver for uh, the Atlanta Falcons. Julio left that game. Um, obviously, they're dealing with a lot of injuries with uh, Austin Hooper. They got rid of Mohamed Sanu. Julio uh, was, was down and out at the end of that game. I expect Julio to be back, but he has a tendency to leave and come back and leave and come back mid-games. And Russell Gage has been pretty good. So I, I think he is someone you could throw out there. I think those are both good calls. And, and Hardman, it's not just for this week. Like, let's just say, even if Tyree Kill is active for the rest of the season, let's just say the Chiefs are like, all right, we've had enough with Sammy Watkins. He's got a lot of targets. He's not getting it done. We're going to throw our rookie in there and see what we have. Now, I don't love the matchups against the Patriots, Broncos, and Bears, but he's got Patrick Mahomes as his, as his quarterback. And if they decide to make him the wide receiver two for the rest of the season at any point during the season, we've got a weekly starter, right? Uh, yeah, I mean he would he would be a, a must start. And and the reality is some of the difficult quote unquote difficult matchups, you know, that's where McCole Harmon can can really surprise and have an end, a good game because this defense is focused on all the big weapons, and then they just kind of sneak McCole on for a play or two, and he takes it seventy four to the house. Now, Tags obviously isn't on the podcast today. I talked about that earlier during the show. Uh, he's just, you know, dealing with a, an illness, giving him a day off and hope he comes back strong. Um, but he did give me his top five waiver wire pickups. Number one, Penny. Number two, Tony Pollard. Number three, David Njoku. We'll get to that later. Number four, Cole Beasley. And then number five is Anthony Miller. Now, I don't have Beasley that high. I didn't ask Tags why he has Beasley that high. But are you seeing him as startable this Thursday against Dallas? Yeah, I mean, I I can see that you you've got uh, Byron, Byron Jones will probably be on John Brown on the outside. Cole Beasley's been uh, he's been serviceable. I mean, you you're talking about four touchdowns in the last six games, so you could do worse. But I'm not excited about Cole Beasley. He would be oh, absolutely not. He would be down on my list. And I'm and if you are doing Cole Beasley, this better be a you know a PPR league where you know even though he's only getting ten yards of reception and you can get a full point for the receptions but no I'm not very hyped on Cole Beasley he's got eight fantasy points in every game except for one this season like I get it he's reliable you know what you're gonna get if you plug him in I don't love the upside I understand why Tags does it Tags plays a lot of PPR as well I've got Beasley a little bit lower if I'm going that route and looking for uh you know a streamer of you know who's available in 80 percent of leagues I'm really interested in both these kids from the Patriots, Jacoby Myers and Nikhil Harry, who were on the field for 80% of the snaps. Now, we didn't see much from either of them because it was so hard to get separation in that game with the conditions of the field. Obviously, the matchup wasn't ideal either, but this week they get Houston secondary, who not only is bad, but they're banged up too. Uh, Philip Dorsett, I think, is going to lose his job. Mohamed Sanu is expected to be out again. Would you be comfortable playing Jacoby Myers or Nikhil Harry this week? And why don't we throw in Alan Lazard here as well, the number two for Green Bay going up against the Giants? I think Nikhil Harry is a guy that you might want to take a shot on. Jacoby Myers is fine. I mean, if you're looking for a Philip Dorsett replacement, and I don't mean that as far as the body comp. He's not a you know smaller speedster the way that Philip Dorsett is, but He's a wide receiver five who can go off sometimes. Exactly. I mean, it, you know, I'm not excited. Nikhil Harry genuinely has the talent to come to the forefront. This last week, he was the only guy with a touchdown in that crazy game, and you don't blame him. You know, he had a couple of drops, and n there wasn't a player out there that didn't have a couple of drops. Edelman's dropping balls. Mari Cooper's dropping balls. I mean, this is they're, – they're in sideways rain, you know, in a hurricane is what it felt like, so – the fact that he was out there, he's a first-round draft pick. The injuries around him have 
thrust him into the starting position. You know, if you've got a plus matchup, then which Houston certainly is, then yeah, I'm I'm fine. I, I would rather hold him. This isn't the time of year that you get a lot of time to figure things out. So I'm not going to start him over guys like Devontae Parker that are just getting it done week in, week out. But if you want to grab him as a speculative ad that he might be able to come through and beast mode his way through the final part of the season, I, I don't think that's outside of the realm of possibility. I've got him wide receiver 47 right now. Someone I wouldn't really love to start, but if you need someone in a pinch, yeah, he'd be all right this week. Um, I'm just adding him as a just in case. I mean, Julian Edelman's been banged up all year. Even throughout his career, we've seen him miss time. If Julian Edelman goes down, we could legitimately be looking at the number one wide receiver during the fantasy football playoffs for Tom Brady. Yes, that could happen. All right, two more wide receivers I want to talk to you about. Neither of them are really playable this week. Uh, John Ross... Antonio Brown would you add either of these guys as a stash for just in case um so John Ross I've added him as a stash on my teams that I have an IR spot I'm definitely not taking up a bench spot for John Ross but if you've got an IR slot that you can just slide him into and then it doesn't hurt you might as well pick him up throw him in there and and just stash him it's exciting now that Andy Dalton is getting the start again because you know, I was looking at that because uh, it was a couple weeks ago when I added John Ross on there, and I'm like, man, he's just, there's no way when he comes back I'm going to be like, yes, I'm, I'm going to play him because Ryan Finley's not, not going to be able to get him the ball. Uh, with Dalton Beck, he's a little bit more exciting. And then the Antonio Brown thing, if you got a deep bench. <laughs> You're going there, aren't you? Then maybe. I mean, look. Obviously, if somehow they repaired things with the Patriots and he got back on the field, but it's not going to happen. And and the reality is this. I'm talking to playoff teams out there, right? Teams that are in the playoffs at this point or at least battling for it, and the whole point is to get there. Fantasy rosters, your rosters out there, are probably already too good to throw a speculative ad of a guy who's 90% not going to play this year. So, you know, if you're in – a keeper league you should be adding him if you're out of the playoffs you know what I mean like there's there's no way take a shot maybe you end up with a waiver wire type of value on a keeper if Antonio Brown is reinstated but if you're shooting for the playoffs this year I have to imagine you've got a better roster than someone you're gonna drop for Antonio Brown I think that's fair uh if you do have a roster spot I'd rather own Antonio Brown than uh take a shot on James Washington or or even John Ross, who we talked about. I don't think John Ross is a bad call. Um, but if you're not playing one of these guys, you might as well go for the upside. So what if it doesn't work out? You pick someone up if you need to, and it's probably about the same you know, the same value as if you would pick up James Washington and play him this week. So I don't mind so much adding Antonio Brown. I definitely understand being opposed to it. Jason, this was a lot of fun. Thank you for taking the time to come on the show during such a busy week for everyone. Uh, no problem. Eat a lot of turkey this week or ham or mashed potatoes or all of it. Have have a good one, man. <laughs> Thank you. You as well. And as I mentioned for the second part of today's show, we've got Joe Pizapia, author of the number one selling Fantasy Black Book series and host of the Fantasy Black Book pod. He's on Twitter at Joe Pizapia 17 Joe, how's it going? Going great, man. Uh, always fun talking a uh, little football with uh, my boys here. And I uh, I hope our other boy, Mr. Taglier, is feeling a little better. I feel bad that he's ill my guess is a little too much fun at that wedding this weekend. I saw the pictures. It looks like he was having a little fun at the open bar. But uh, seriously, though, Tags, hope you feel better. I'm glad he's getting some time, too. He has a lot of riding to do this week. So uh, it's good that he's getting a little bit of time off for this podcast. And, uh, you know, it's also good because he's not here to police our fun. And so we get to play Would You Rather really quick before we jump into quarterbacks, tight ends, and DST. And here's the question. Now, in both these scenarios, Joe, you cannot ever wear a shirt again, okay? Would you rather have a belly button five times too large or armpit hair five times too long? <laughs> um, I'll have the weird belly button. Uh, I, think that's, <laughs> I think that's the weird thing. Okay, you know what? Actually, you know what? I'll tell you what. Uh, I, I, you can at least keep the manscaping with the underarms now that I'm thinking about that. I mean, it's growing at a weird rate. No, it always has to be five times too long. You can't like. Oh, yeah. Oh, I can't. It doesn't just grow at an abnormal length. I mean, I guess you could like put it up in a bun or something. Ah, the underarm man bun. I have not heard of that <laughs> yet. That is that's definitely a look. I know it's very, very big in lower Manhattan these days. Um, I'm going <laughs> to 
<laughs> uh, the belly button sounds like a fun thing that like, you know, it's almost like a, you know, like a party trick kind of thing. I feel like it would be less in prone to infections or something like that. But man, that would be embarrassing. Uh, kind of the, the giant I mean, belly button. Maybe it's helpful. Maybe you could put a beer in there. Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, this <laughs> might not actually be so bad. Belly button it is. How about you, Bobby? I was the question asker. I don't have to give an answer. <laughs> oh, oh, so it's fun at my expense. Now I see. Okay, I see your game, my friend. I'm definitely going with the armpit hair, man. No doubt about it. There's no way I'm having a belly button that big. I tell you, you're missing a beer cozy right there. You know, put a little ice in that thing. <laughs> tailgate away. <laughs> All right, Joe, let's get on over to the quarterbacks. And if you need a streamer this week, would you say that Sam Darnold, again, is the top streamer for the third straight week? Uh, it's hard to say no. I mean, he's he's definitely looking very good right now. Uh, the We know the matchups are favorable here, and we've talked about this, and, you know, I talked about this like six weeks ago when I kept telling everyone to buy Le'Veon Bell, and I just felt like, look, just look at the schedule. Things will get better. I know everything seems bleak now, but I always feel like the football season is three pieces. There's always the beginning, the middle, and the end. And and I feel like sometimes in the middle, a lot of people just get so disenfranchised, they can't see the end ahead of them. There's always evolution in a football season. And the Jets are not a good football team, but the Jets have a favorable schedule. They just played the Giants, they have the Redskins, they played the Oakland Raiders. They're moving in the right direction there. Le'Veon Bell is getting healthier. And look, Robbie Anderson had a good game this past week. It was not a Crowder game, unfortunately, but you see Ryan Griffin got paid on the weekend. So he's got weapons at his disposal. And he's got favorable matchups. So right now, I mean, even going into next week, it's hard not to even consider him ahead of guys like Carson Wentz. And uh, dare I say Tom Brady, I don't know if I'm ready to do that yet. But Well, with with the elbow issue, and you're, you're a Patriots fan saying this, but it just doesn't quite look the same. It's nice to have Isaiah Wynn back, by the way. That offensive line looked a lot better. I don't think you can judge anybody off that game on Sunday afternoon because that weather was just, it was such a heinous situation there. Um, so you don't want to take too much out of that at all. But... I'll tell you what, if Nikhil Harry can have a run similar to what Malcolm Mitchell had a few years ago, I think that would be enough with a healthy new to get everything done. He just needs more guys on the field at the same time. And in terms of in terms of ability, I mean, it's a checkered past with ability outside of Randy Moss. And yeah, he had Welker for that run and, and Edelman's played well. But, you know, he doesn't have a lot of stars. It's the Dion branches of the world It's the Troy Browns. I mean, those are the guys that kind of historically got it done with him. So you just need more options on the field. That way he can spread the ball around and do what he does best, which is find the weakness in the defense and then exploit it. So keep an eye on Nikhil Harry because that was a nice touchdown catch in a tough spot. So if he starts to trend in a better direction, even for a little run here, he could be a guy worth owning. Well, Brady has a really good matchup this week against Houston. Right now, I've got him in my top eight quarterbacks. Donald's not quite there. I've got him at 11 right now. He's going up against Cincinnati and breaking news right before the podcast. Andy Dalton is going to be the starter for the Bengals, so they might be able to keep it close. Maybe the Jets are even playing keep up, and that's not what we've seen in the last couple weeks. Uh, they've got wins over the Giants, over Washington, over Oakland, and he's only thrown 30, 30, 29 passes in that time, averaging 26 fantasy points per game. I think he's a solid start, but would you rather go with him over Nick Foles, who's got a matchup at home against Tampa Bay? He's only 33% owned on Yahoo. Ryan Tannehill, 26% owned. He's been killing it. Not as good of a matchup against Indianapolis, though. Would you rather have Darnold, Tannehill, or Foles this week? Uh, that's an interesting one here. Uh, Tannehill's played very well here. Uh, it's a little difficult to know who it's going to be <laughs> on a week-to-week -week basis of, of what receiver kind of pops up and is useful. Looking forward here, um, you know, getting Dalton back, that's not surprising that they went back to him. It was important for them to get a look at Ryan Finley. I think you'll, you'll like that the fact that they, they let's find out what the kid is. Let's see what he is. Well, yeah. And now they have a two game lead for the first overall pick. That's the real reason they're going back. To you him. know, Tannehill's ability to run the football a little bit has been useful lately. It kind of makes me, you know, intrigued by him. I'm not feeling right now the Jaguars I as bad as the Bucks are. I don't know. It's it's a very tough situation for me. I actually feel best about Darnold, to tell you the truth, against the Bengals, because I feel like that Bengals defense is just it's just awful. I mean, don't look too much into that total that you saw this past Sunday, because the one thing you can look at that game is and realize that Pittsburgh had nobody. They had no Connor. They had no Juju Smith-Schuster. I mean, it was just it was nobody left in that game for them to play. So I think I would lean towards towards Darnold because I think he has the most at his disposal and the best matchup and the best overall. But I think in the end, those guys will all be pretty close. I would agree with that. You know, I'm looking at Yahoo projections because a lot of people who are building their lineups are going to be looking at these and they're going to say, well, I need to pick up a quarterback. It's telling me Nick Foles is the best pickup of this group. I would just say ignore that and go get Sam Darnold. It's a great matchup. He's been playing great. 
I, I, Andy Dalton coming back, I think, could make the game script better. I would go with Sam Darnold. Yeah, you know, look, I understand why it's saying falls because when you're plugging things data entry wise and you and you get the bucks that come up on the other side, you see the massive passing totals usually against that bucks. And and I understand that. I get that. But look, Leonard Fournette has been out of his mind good. He's been so good this year. And, you know, if he's able to continue to catch the ball to the backfield as he has, I mean, from scrimmage, like he's right there basically with Christian McCaffrey and a couple other guys and Michael Thomas. He's right in that top five when you go look at that stat. So that's an incredible thing to consider that he's, you know, not quite there, but he's certainly in an elite level. But yeah, I just, there's something about this Jaguars team that just doesn't feel right. And there's something about the Bucks right now. They just feel like they're fighting in a lot of these games here. And there's, they still have deficits, but I feel like they're fighting. And I don't know. I think I'm just out on the Jags. And who knows? If he struggles, maybe they do go back to Minshew. I know they said they wouldn't, but you never know. Well, Todd Bowles has really turned this Buccaneers defense around. They're really getting after the quarterback. The Jags can't protect the quarterback. And Nick Foles, if I told you he had 95 pass attempts in the last two weeks and just compiled uh, two touchdowns in that time, you know, 560 yards, 560 yards sounds good for a two-week sample size, but 95 attempts? There's no way they keep up all this passing. There's no way. No, you look, it's they got behind in those games, too. I think that's a little bit why we're into that. And that's the whole thing. You're looking right now at the Jaguars defense being the reason for that number. Because Jags defense is down at 22 overall on PFF. It's bad. Yeah. Uh, keep that in mind. The whole concept in your mind of, oh, the Jaguars are a great defensive team because you're kind of conditioned to that over the last couple of years. That's a fallacy. That is not truth. So go back and make sure you look at what's going on there because this is going to be a big day for Winston and that group. I mean, choose your color. Could be uh, could be Evans, could be Godwin, could be both. But I'll tell you what, man. It's the Jaguars defense is the reason you're getting those passing totals. That's why because they're just from playing from behind every week. All right, we've got tight ends and then DST to talk about as well. But first, I want to talk about one of the sponsors of today's podcast, Roman. Guys, talking about erectile dysfunction isn't easy. Usually people just brush it off or blame others saying, like I lost my mojo, or we can avoid it altogether with excuses like, I had a long day at work. Sorry, honey, I'm just not feeling it. But with Roman, it is easy to talk about with a real doctor who can prescribe real medication. It's simple, safe, and totally discreet. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your own home. The doctor is going to work with you to find the best treatment plan if medication is appropriate. And then Roman's going to ship it to you for free with two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward, simple, and discreet. Getting started is simple. Just go to GetRoman.com slash FantasyPros and complete an online visit. Guys, erectile dysfunction used to be tough to tackle, but now there's Roman. Complete an online visit today to connect with a doctor and take care of it. Just go to GetRoman.com slash FantasyPros to get a free online visit and free two-day shipping. That's GetRoman.com slash FantasyPros for a free visit to get started. Get Roman.com slash fantasy pros. Let's go to the tight end position now, Joe. And man, I'll tell you what. Last week we were looking at, hey, there's five or six guys you could legitimately pick up and stream. I wouldn't feel terrible about it. This week there are zero. I mean, you could go with David and Joku who's coming back, but he gets Pittsburgh, not a very good matchup. Who knows how many snaps he's going to play, if he's going to be 100%. He's splitting targets with uh, uh, Jarvis Landry and Odell Beckham. I couldn't figure out which one to say first because Jarvis Landry's been out playing him, which is just crazy. Yeah, he has. I mean, do we want to trust in Joku right off the bat? Or would you rather go with someone like Mike Gusecki, who's getting yeah. consistent targets, <laughs> bad matchup, it's Miami? That was the guy in my head. I was like, well, I think I'd rather have Gusecki, and then you said it. Me too, but it just feels so yucky. It does, but look, Ryan Fitzpatrick's going to throw the football because, in, in your words, yucky. When you say yucky, that really pertains to the Dolphins' run game. It's awful. You know, a lot of a lot of people are out there, uh, you know, telling the whole Patrick Laird narrative. This is like, that wasn't uh, necessarily working out. And we know what Balazs <laughs> is. So the Dolphins are going to throw the ball and the Eagles are not very good at stopping folks from doing that. So I actually think Gusecki is in play I and mean, he has touchdown upside. And and right now, when you're looking for streaming tight ends here outside of that, you know, that top 12 kind of group. I mean, maybe you can stream a guy like Dawson Knox. Maybe maybe you can get away with that during the week. Uh, you got to pick him up early. Look, there's definitely opportunities there. There's a couple guys who are just looking for that touchdown. But yeah, it's if you didn't get on that waiver wire and get guys like Griffin and Hollister, then I think you've missed the last wave of tight end. I mean, and you might want to check. In your league, you might be able to get Gerald Everett, 66% owned. Dallas Goddard is another good start this week against Miami, 53% owned. That's a good one, too, because they have no wide receivers out there. 
So that's a sneaky one where people look at and go, ah, well, he's the second tight end, but you know what? He's really like the number two wide receiver because there really is nobody else there. Hollister is now 80% owned, so you probably missed the boat on all those guys. And if I can't get Mike Isicki, who is my favorite streamer this week, I've got him in my top 12, uh, then I guess it would be Knox. I mean, maybe Noah Fant, horrible matchup against the Chargers. Uh, TJ Hawkinson gets the Bears. That's actually a good matchup for tight ends. But uh, yeah, I think I'm with you. I think I'd rather go Dawson Knox against Dallas, which kind of funnels targets to those tight ends because they cover so well on the outside that they kind of leave the, the middle of the field open for the taking. Yeah, uh, look, Noah Fant to me, I know a couple weeks ago when I was on, we had that conversation and uh, Noah Fant had a good game this week, not so much against Buffalo, but really nobody played well against Buffalo. But I feel like with that pass rush, if Brandon Allen could just get rid of the football quickly and they can get a situation where Fant is in there blocking one of those guys, whether it be Bosa or Ingram, and then get out and release quick, that's op- actually an opportunity if they really game plan smartly for that pass rush Fant could be very active. Now you have two choices. You can either dump the ball off to Lindsay real quick, or you can have, like I said, Fant go out there, block, chip somebody, release out, and then hit him with the football, in which case I would also think Fant is very viable too if he's in your league. I think so as well. He's got that big play threat, you know, if he catches the ball. Yeah, he's a big boy. He, he can take it to the <laughs> house. He can out. He can outrun a, uh, a linebacker. He can go up and get the ball in traffic in the red zone. He's got a lot of upside. Now this is a bad offense to be a part of, but he's getting the target share. Uh, it wasn't a great matchup, a horrible matchup last week. In fact, the hardest in football and tags tried to warn us off it. I didn't listen to him. Hopefully you did listen to him, uh, but he didn't have a good game. That doesn't mean Fant won't be reliable moving forward. Just depends on if he's available in your league. So if he is, would you prefer Fant or Gesicki? Uh, that's, that's a tough one. I think in PPR, you want Fant because I do think he's getting more targets overall since Brandon Allen took over a quarterback. I think if you're playing a standard or half point PPR, you would go with Kaziki and just hope for that touchdown. I think that's the way you play it. At the end of the day, they might have the same amount of points, you know, when you when you take the, the formats into consideration potentially. So just keep that in mind. I think that's spot on. Joe, let's move on over to DST and then we'll play a quick lightning round of drop or keep. And at DST this week, uh, for streamers at least, we've got some serious options. I'm looking at my top 12 rankings. Nine of the top 12 are owned in less than 40% of leagues. I am loving this. Mm, that's definitely a good one. Well, like like I said, Seasons in threes. You're in this last third now. Yeah. Things are changing again. Teams that you thought were one thing, you know, turn out to be something else. And now they're evolving uh, another time. And there's always this constant evolution. So I'm curious to hear what these names are. Yeah. So Philadelphia at Miami. I think that's an obvious one every week. Well, that's an obvious one there. Yeah. Let's see who's getting Dwayne Haskins. Oh, it's Carolina. So Carolina, they're in the conversation. (laughs) Um, The New York Jets, I would have put at number one, even ahead of Philly because they were getting Ryan Finley. But now that Andy Dalton's there. I'm going to move the Jets down a little bit, and uh, let's throw in uh, one more here. Well, look, they weren't winning games either <laughs> when Andy Dalton was there. They were they were still winless and pretty bad. But I mean, Andy Dalton is out there throwing absolute ducks. Like, Andy Dalton's a competent quarterback. who you're, You don't expect multiple turnovers every time he takes the field. So uh, for my third one, I'm going to go with the Chargers at Denver. So who would you rather have, Philly at Miami, Carolina face Washington, or the Chargers at Denver? I'm going to go with Carolina. I'm just going to go take my shot on, on the kid. Hopefully Dwayne Haskins will uh, stop taking selfies and get back in there and uh, realize that he's got a game this week. But um, <laughs> I, I think I'm going to go with Carolina. They definitely need a cookie matchup here. <laughs> had a rough go here. You know, the Falcons beat them unexpectedly, and then they went to a dogfight in there in New Orleans. They should have won. Kickers can't kick anymore, so that's unfortunate. So I think you get Carolina back at home. Redskins on the road. Lots of turnover potential there. I'll take my chances with the Panthers. They also just lost Dontari Poe as well, which, I mean, they had the worst run defense in the NFL, and then they lose their best run stuffer. Well, luckily, the Redskins aren't very good at anything, so it doesn't really matter. There's no strength. You know, even if they give up 28, 30 points like they have the past, you know, couple of weeks, even if they give that up, Dwayne Haskins over under two and a half turnovers. <sighs> Probably over or, you know, that's good. number. I I would say it's, you know, either two or three, maybe more than that. Uh, And it doesn't matter how many points you're giving up. If you get those turnovers, that's what matters for DST. So I've got the Eagles one Panthers number two. Where do you have the Packers this week? I'm curious how high because because I don't know if you realize, but Daniel Jones has 14 fumbles this year. No, he does not. Go look. Holy cow. 10 lost 14 total. Yeah, I've got the I've got Green Bay at six. So I've got the Chargers at five. Okay. You might want to bump them up to two. 
<laughs> so if you're if you're picking them up, are you picking them up ahead of Carolina, ahead of Philadelphia? I I don't know. All I know is I just like Daniel Jones. God bless him. Like he's he's got like he's got some ability. You've certainly seen some flashes, but you got to protect the football, son. I mean, you just the the funny thing is like when he gets sacked, a lot of these quarterbacks, like you see Brady, when he gets sacked, he's like, uh oh, I'm about to get sacked, and he tucks the ball. And Daniel Jones is just like. As he's getting crushed, he's like, what is going on here? And his eyes, like, bug out of his head. It's like he has no idea that the pass rush is coming. Well, he's doing that that thing that you, like, you're in college still. And you're like, I can make a play. I'm Daniel Jones. I'm better than everyone on the field. No, you're not. <laughs> this is the NFL now. It's a different situation. And it's really hurt. It, look, it's hurt his overall numbers. It's hurt the Giants. And it continues to put a lot of pressure on a defense that isn't very good. So although the Packers got shellacked, which you should have seen coming, considering how bad that line played a couple weeks ago against the Chargers. You had to know that hell was coming with them. And that, yes, that's a little tombstone reference for those of you who enjoyed the film, uh, that <laughs> he was going to get absolutely lit up in this game against the 49ers this past weekend. And he was, so it'll get better against the giants this week for sure. So Joe, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Okay. You're a Patriots fan who lives in New York. Well, New Jersey technically. So, okay. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's even more disgusting. Yeah. You have to choose. If you're starting your franchise right now, would you rather have Sam Darnold or uh, Daniel Jones? Daniel, I kept thinking Josh <laughs> Allen. Josh Allen is always on my mind because he's so fun. I'll take Josh Allen. Can I have Josh Allen? <laughs> yeah, for real. I'll take anybody <laughs> named Allen. I'll take Josh Allen. I'll take Kyle <laughs> you're, Allen. you're taking Brandon Allen over Darnold? No, Brandon Allen. No, you got to draw a line somewhere. But, um, <laughs> you know, it's tricky because I think they're very different. I like them both quite a bit, actually. I, I mean, if I was redoing the first round, uh, I would take either of them in the first round without hesitation, which is better than I would have said last year. I'll, I'll tell you what. I'm looking at it. If you had to hold me and say you got to pick one of those two New York quarterbacks, I think I would take Darnold because I, I, I think so far you've seen a little bit more completion of a quarterback. Daniel Jones is still getting by on a little bit of guile and a little bit of like making plays. But it's the it's the errors. Well, and a little bit of Saquon Barkley. That helps a little bit. Well, you know what? He's gotten a zero Saquon Barkley. He wasn't on the injury report this week, and he was just 79K on FanDuel. And I thought that was a real opportunity there. And this was another just, you know, stinker he threw up there. And it's and it looks like he's just Well, they're not using him in the passing game. They can't. His shoulder is a bummer. Well, that's what I mean. It looks like he's it's just a waste of a season now. And now you have to understand that, you know, if you did get out of the Saquon business early on and you got paid pretty well for it in season long that it actually ended up being the right call because he has not been Saquon Barkley this year, and all you can do is hope that next year you get him at a discount and you get a better version of him. Both Sam Darnold and Daniel Jones are six months younger than Joe Burrow, and everyone's super excited, like, this Joe Burrow kid's going to be so good. And I like Joe Burrow. He's a good college quarterback. But imagine Sam Darnold still playing at USC with Michael Pittman Jr. Imagine Daniel Jones still playing in college. How good would these kids look? Well, and Burrow, because Burrow moved from school to school, I think that's, you know, people forget that a little bit. That's part of that reason of why he's a little older, because he was sitting and waiting and he wasn't getting the opportunity. So he had to move on. And I've, you know, from what I've seen this year, I mean, I think it's a, especially with the Tua injury, it would be shocking to me if Burrow wasn't the number one. But I do think he's going to be a guy that comes in and starts, you know, like Kyler Murray did week one. I just think that's going to be the thing. And probably right now it looks like Cincinnati, <laughs> but that's a pretty good spot to walk into. You got Mixon, you got Boyd, you got some pieces. You know, if you could just build up the line a little bit. I don't think A.J. Green comes back, but uh, Auden Tate looks capable. You know, I think A.J. Green, I told you last time, I think Oakland, that's the spot for A.J. Green. Let me tell you, that's a great landing spot for him. Yeah, and uh, Zach Taylor has not been so bad with the offense, at least what I've seen. Uh, they don't have much to work with because their offensive line is so horrible, but it would be a good landing spot for Burrow. And uh, my point isn't that Burrow's bad. My point is that I think Sam Darnold and Daniel Jones are actual franchise quarterbacks, and I wouldn't get too discouraged if I'm a Jets or Giants fan. He's just got to protect the football more. Just stop fumbling the ball. All right, let's play uh, drop or keep. And, um, you know, it's really different. Now that we're over with the buys, you don't need that fifth wide receiver um, just in case a bye week comes up or injuries or anything like that. That's what you've got your wide receiver four for. Um, you don't need a, a Jamal Williams that you can start in a pinch if you need somebody. What you want is upside. So, with that being said, are you dropping Alshon Jeffrey? Oh, uh, that's tricky. I mean, I'd like to keep him because, in theory, you know, you say, okay, well, can he get healthy enough and help me in the playoffs? And I know that's asking a lot. Miami, Giants, Washington, Dallas. I'm not dropping Alshon. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I want to say they had the Giants, and I thought Washington was in there, too, because I remember it was like came back around. So, no, I'm not dropping him because of the schedule. If you can get him right 
in the next two weeks and on the football field, those matchups are good enough to warrant at least a flex play. And they need somebody so desperately. I am i don't think you drop him. No, I really don't. Yeah, I think he's wide receiver three when he comes back, if he comes back for those matchups. And, you know, these are the types of guys that you would want to pick up somebody who has that upside to be a wide receiver two, a wide receiver three, if he gets on the field. I think it's a toss up for if, if Jeffrey gets back on the field. And, um, you know, if he does, you'll be starting him. Um, it was the same with Will Fuller. We hang, hung on to him for all this time. And then finally, we uh, we got to use him, and, and it worked out. Um, what about Sammy Watkins? That's another tricky one, too. I think it's the same thing, but at, at the same time, it's like, well, he just had three targets with Mahomes back. Like, Well, I feel like you're in a spot here where, you know, when you start talking about, like, do I drop guys? You have to look and say, all right, who are the guys on offenses where there could be a potential need? You know Tyreek Hill is not 100%. So I feel like guys like Watkins, those aren't the kind of guys you're dropping. I think it's guys that you've held on to through the bye weeks to play and they really didn't do much. It's like the Deontay Johnsons of the world. Those are the kind of names that I'd more be apt to drop. I'm trying to think of other guys that kind of fit that bill. But you know what I mean? It's like those second and third wide receivers on bad teams. I think you hold the guys on good offenses with good quarterbacks in the hope that maybe you get a matchup or if there's an injury to somebody else ahead of them on your roster that you need somebody, at least you know, hey, Sammy Watkins plays with Patrick Mahomes, so I'm not dropping him, but, you know, I'd rather hold on to him at this point than, you know, than Auden Tate, potentially, or somebody like that. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think you can use Sammy Watkins this week against Oakland. Uh, it's the next It's the next three weeks I'm worried about. The Patriots, the Broncos, the Bears. Like, am I playing him in those weeks? I don't think so. Yeah, that's going to be fascinating to watch. That, that Patriots game against the Chiefs is going to be fascinating because, you know, you're going to get them in New England, and you're also going to get a spot there where... You know, it's going to be that defense against Mahomes, and that's what you're going to watch and see whether or not the the Pats can keep pace if they have to with Mahomes in this one. Now, last year, that wasn't a problem. This year, clearly an issue. So that defense really... And look, I still think the Patriots can get to the Super Bowl playing this style of football. I mean, the Ravens did it, and they won in 2000. They had a dominant defense, and they would win games 14-12, and they would score one of those touchdowns on defense. And you know what? They won that way. It's very possible to do. What about Larry Fitzgerald? He's been so bad the last two weeks. He hasn't done anything. I know. And he's got the Rams this week, too. I, I think it's it's one of those things if you... I'll tell you what. If you had to cut a guy between like him and A.J. Brown, who's sporadic, I would keep A.J. Brown. Wow. Okay. I think, I, think it's, I think it's come down to that. It's like, who's going upward on that trend where you're like, if I have to play this guy, am I going to get anything out of him? And I think if it was between... And I'm just giving a, a hypothetical here. That kind of a player who's more of a boomer bust guy. I think at this stage, I would take that because Fitzgerald, outside of that early in the season, it's been pretty quiet. I don't know why they're not giving him targets because like the last three weeks, he's got 17 targets and guess what? He's 17 receptions. Yeah, I mean, like he's always catching the football is never his problem. I wonder if he's not getting open like he used to or getting the separation he used to get. He's not playing enough snaps. I don't know if it's just, you know, durability or, or what they're trying to mix in. The kids, it, it's frustrating. It is frustrating. It definitely is. But look, it's a Hall of Fame career. Uh, it's unfortunate, you know, especially because it started off so well this year where you thought, oh, my gosh, he's back. It's going to be 100 catches again. It, and unfortunately, it just never materialized. All right, let's go one more wide receiver, D.D. Westbrook. Then we'll go to running backs. Uh, D.D. Westbrook, I think, you know, this week, uh, I think I'm keeping him this week <laughs> against the Bucks. <laughs> you know, I'm looking at the matchup. <laughs> if he was on the waiver wire right now. He'd be like my number one waiver wire pickup besides Penny. Yeah, I would because, again, I believe if you talk about the Jaguars defense, where they're at right now, you look at the last couple games, they're giving up a ton of points. The Bucks are irresponsibly aggressive. They're going to throw the football whether you like it or not, whether they make mistakes or not. So for me, I think Westbrook is definitely in play this week. He's even startable this week, so I would not drop him this week. I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, the reason I'm asking about these guys isn't because I'm considering dropping them or anything. These are the guys I'm getting a lot of questions about, Joe. So let's go to the running back position. Uh, Jordan Howard, who's been out for Philadelphia. Are we dropping him or thinking maybe he comes back and I can use him? You keep him because of that schedule. You hope that he can be maybe a flex or an RB2 kind of guy that falls in the end zone once or twice because God knows they need him. And look, the Eagles are, are running out of opportunities here. They really are. They are just, you know, they put a tough game against the England lost. They played a, a sloppy game against a sloppy Seattle game on the other side of that game, too. And it's just, you know, it, unfortunately, they came out with an L there, too. So they're really back against the wall here. So fortunately, Dallas is six and five as well. So, well, that's the saving grace is nobody wants to run away with it. You know, if the Giants had just handled their business a little bit and some of these games that were really 
really within their reach. Like even this week, I thought that game was in their reach against Chicago and a couple weeks ago against the Jets. They could have been in this conversation, which would have been hilarious. Yeah, they would have right there. <laughs> I mentioned Jamal Williams earlier. Are you keeping him? Do you think he's a good like uh, handcuff stash? Well, I wouldn't call him the handcuff because, you know, he's just he has his own role in the offense. And Aaron Jones has been so good this year. But I would, again, hang on to him. I think this week everybody eats against the Giants because that Giants D is not very good and the Packers will bounce back. He'll be a fringe top 30 running back this week. I think he's a flex RB. He's not an RB2. You play, he's, a, he's a PPR flex guy. If you want to drop him in standard because, I don't know, maybe you feel like Quadre Allison's going to get more looks or something like that, okay. Yeah, but, but, but let's say he's like your RB4. Would you rather have him or Tony Pollard? Um, if I'm a Zeke owner, I'd rather keep Tony Pollard. But <laughs> I'd rather have Tony Pollard regardless because I'm not using Jamal Williams in that situation. That's fair. Uh, like I said, Jamal Williams has the ability to score touchdowns too every now and then. That's kind of that thing about him that keeps that value up. So that's the one thing. That's the sticking point with him where I would hang on to him. But I see your point for sure. Matt Breed, is he coming back? Do we wait for it? I think you should. I think he showed you enough. And Tevin Coleman showed you enough inconsistency where you would have to think that you know, if Breida can come back, that Breida's going to get his opportunities, but they've also showed... I mean, Mostert's been the number one over the last two weeks. He has more snaps, more touches than Coleman. You know, they've kind of proven the theory that you really don't have to have a true number one guy. If you have a good offensive line and you just, you know, mix and match and keep somebody out there healthy, you know, the Pats have done it for years, and now they kind of took that page out where there's no true number one. It's a running back by committee with a bunch of guys who have different styles and... You know, different matchups, 10 for different guys. But I would definitely hang on to Breed. I think he showed you enough. And God knows running back can just disappear at the drop of a hat. So I think you got to hang on to him. Did I say Breed? I meant Raheem Mostert. Well, I think Mostert you hang on to because Breed hasn't been healthy. And Coleman. Oh, I meant in terms of leading the team in in snaps and touches the last two weeks. Because obviously Breed has been out. Well, they've got a fascinating situation here coming up because... Now you're going to get a real test of that 49ers team. When they go on the road to Baltimore, that's the test. The the Packers weren't the test. And so far, there's two things that the 49ers have struggled with all year. It's two teams. They struggled a little bit with the Cardinals, and they struggled a little bit, obviously, with the Seahawks. Now, what do those two quarterbacks have in common? They are mobile. So as great as that pass rush is, when you get a quarterback who can move around the pocket, and Lamar Jackson, I'm pretty sure, fits that bill that's going to be something to see because he's the kind of guy that might give that aggressive style fits. And that defense for Baltimore has played very well since Marcus Peters showed up. Pass rush got better. He started picking balls off. He started locking guys down. All of a sudden, everything kind of fell into place. That's going to be the matchup. And, you know, Mostert's going to have his work cut out for him in that game. Let me tell you, that's a tough matchup. The Ravens D against the run has been very good in the last six weeks. All right, let's go two more running backs here to end the show. LaShawn McCoy. Cut him or keep him. God, uh, Kansas City running back. <laughs> Where's Carlos Hyde? Can we get Carlos Hyde back there? Can we rewind the season and put Carlos Hyde back, please? Oh, man. I can't wait for them to sign Kareem Hunt in the offseason. I'm just waiting for that to happen. I still think Darwin Thompson's the man. Like I, We never got to see Darwin Thompson. All these guys are struggling. I know. Why can't we see? Why can't we just see? Can we just see? And same with Justin Jackson. Like, Justin Jackson is just rotting on the Chargers, and he's amazing. Mike Boone on the Vikings. Well, I mean, the Vikings obviously are doing the right thing, but Mike Boone's amazing, and we're never going to get to see him. Let me tell you, I don't, you know what? I think you hold on to McCoy just because. Yeah, because it's the Chiefs offense. Like, what happened with Damian Williams in the last four weeks last year when he became the starter? Yeah, I'm not saying you start him, but you hold on to him, man, because it's, I mean, it's just nobody, it's default. It's a hold by default. Are we holding Adrian Peterson still, or can we cut him loose? Uh, you know what? I think you can cut him at the age and the fact that it's time for them to really turn the page to Geis. Like, this is it. This is your opportunity here to see what you have. But AP is a lot better than Geis, though. That's the thing. And they get Carolina this week. I mean, I guess if you're not using AP, cut him this week. But I think you could use him this week. You could, but, uh, you know, I'm not feeling good about your chances if you have to. Yeah, If you're using him, you're almost definitely not making the playoffs. Like, if he's your third running back. You're just sure. setting a lineup <laughs> so you're not that guy or gal that doesn't set the lineup in your league because you're out of it. But I don't know, man. I just I feel like the Redskins really need to make this push and to see what guys is. And I understand, like, you know, first game back, he had a couple moments, a nice little touchdown catch there. Just give the kid the ball. You know, I'm not saying give him the ball 25 times. But let's give him the ball 15 times. Let's see what's going on there. Let's let's start to make some evaluations of the talent because whoever comes in next is going to have to take a look at this and this roster and make some changes, potentially wholesale changes top to bottom. I mean, you could see them even say Haskins is not the guy, depending on who they bring in. It's amazing how 
different this roster could look year over year. All right, Joe, that's all for today's show. Really appreciate you coming on. No, always a pleasure talking football. Good luck to everybody. All right, and I want to say thanks to the sponsors of today's show, Roman. If you guys go to GetRoman.com slash FantasyPros, you'll get a free online visit to get your ED taken care of and free two-day shipping. That's GetRoman.com slash FantasyPros. And also, when you're doing your Christmas shopping, make sure to check out Pristine Auction. You're guaranteed to find something that's a good value that you absolutely love for who you're shopping for. That's PristineAuction.com, P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E, Auction.com. And while you're at it, Sign up for our signed Dak Prescott full-size helmet giveaway that ends this Saturday. You can check out the details at fantasypros.com slash contest. And by the way, don't forget about my playbook, which is going to make your waiver wire hunting so much easier. Go to fantasypros.com slash my playbook. For Jason Moore and Joe Pisapia, I'm Bobby Sylvester. Thanks for listening and enjoy your football.